that the model being implemented is for labor or cost or some type of savings or reduction. And I don't think AI can be successful that way. Yeah. It can be successful yeah. if it's used as a tool for the employee. Rob, what's shaking there, buddy? How you you got, uh, good. Got uh, 4th of July coming up, although this isn't going to come out uh, by then. That's right. Yeah. We've got, uh, a holiday got any here. big plans for the uh, holiday weekend? Yeah. You know, going to go up to the lake and do a little boating and uh, relax a little awesome. bit. How about you? Uh, guess going to go get, get myself on the back of a horse. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Most Happy of the time. weekend. I'm going to work. I'm going to work half a Friday anyway. Cool. So uh, we don't normally have guests on our show, no. but um, uh, I invited a colleague of mine, Daryl Clements, who is the principal and owner of a business and human resources consulting firm, DCC Group, which he started in 2006. So he's got quite a bit of experience in his own business and in his uh, uh, and what he knows. And, and through his company, Daryl provides HR strategy and tactical consulting advice and some direct recruitment and hiring. He also offers tailored solutions to clients who need HR operations design, diversity strategy development, uh, HR policy and employee relationship relations, excuse me, uh, HR startup project management and hands-on HR executive support. Wow. So he's our HR maven. Wow. Uh, in the room, um, because of course I don't know squat about HR, and you probably don't either, Rob. No. So, um, and we have a really interesting topic that you're going to introduce, and we're going to talk about. So, Daryl, welcome to uh, our show. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Carol. Yeah, great to have uh, you, Daryl. Great to have right. you. This is uh, so, Rob. You know, this is yeah. uh, pretty cool. That we have a guest uh, this week, uh, Carol, on this on this segment, um, and I think it's. Uh, I think it's the right thing to do. I mean, we're going to get, a, I'm really excited to see what happens for the next few minutes here as we talk about this. This is an article, uh, Carol, you and I saw on ZDNet um, and the title, AI could conduct your next job interview, meet brain trust air. Um, so I read the article, saw the video of what's coming next. Uh, obviously I want to tee you guys up. You've got experience in this business. Um, I come from a different angle and we'll get to that, but really, um, can AI, can AI actually do interviews? Can AI actually insert into HR and bring value? Can AI actually do what this is uh, saying it can do, which is find candidates, conduct interviews, and cut down the time that it takes to actually fill jobs? Uh, I'm really, I'm really, I can't wait to hear what you guys say about this because I know what I wanted to say, but I, I need to get the experts in here to kick it off. So I don't know who wants to go first. Carol, you want to go? Daryl, why don't you, why don't you kick it off? I'll I'll start out by saying I don't have a lot of hope that AI will be able to do a very good job. AI will exist and AI can be supportive, but it is not a replacement. It's not a panacea. And it is largely going to be as effective as whomever maintains full control over it. Mm -hmm. And the reality of a lot of that is if you're unhappy with how your recruitment is working right now, I don't think AI is going to smooth that over for you. Yeah. I can't uh, disagree with anything you just said. You know, um, uh, Brain Trust started, we, we spoke to one of their executives, Daryl and I did, and, you know, they started as kind of being an alternative to Fiverr or Upwork, Right. So they have this, you know, massive database. It's, it's, the pay is a little done a little bit differently. The, the person uh, that you would be hiring, they keep all the money. They don't have to pay a percentage back like you do with, you know, Upwork or something. Um, and then they, they moved into this new kind of a product where their AI interviews does the first round of interviews. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, we had a long talk with that individual about that. Uh, and, and, you know, she, she was really quite bright. And, you know, as I said to her, I'm still pretty skeptical, but she was very clear that this is not to be used for, you know, the kind of stuff I'm used to doing, right? I don't know the kind of work that your stuff, you know, used to doing when it was in search, when you do search work, but, you know, it's for sort of the people, maybe it's, you know, software engineers or, you know, those types of people, you know, more technical, uh, more technical. Um, but you know, it, it doesn't change my skeptical attitude of that. Right. I would agree. And I 
think using it as a replacement or a fill-in when there's an absolute gap may have been the idea. Mm -hmm. But when you look at it from the user perspective, there are a lot of concerns about how decisions are made and the tool itself, how reactive is it to the person's situation? You could be asked a question and have a different understanding of what the question is, but AI can't ask follow-up questions. It doesn't ask questions with nuance. It doesn't ask questions from multiple angles. It's typically going to go down a list, um, ask all those list questions, and then make a decision uh, based on what the response to that was. And that may not be the best way to find out about someone's background. Well, that's fantastic. You know, and, and the first question we saw in the interview is, hi, you know, so-and-so that I'm interviewing. Um, I can't remember if it was, a, 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 you know, tell me about, tell me a little bit about yourself or something. One of those types of questions, right? Mm-hmm. And she went on to answer the question. And I thought to myself, oh, I could trip that thing up immediately because, you know, what does every salesperson know about when you're asked an open-ended question? <laughs> <laughs> Not to answer it, to ask follow a, up with another question. Ask a question. Right? To, Thank you. So, my, yeah. right. What would you like to know? What, yeah. you know, where should I start? Right. So I thought to myself, I'd really like to interview with that AI to see what happens mm-hmm. right under those circumstances. You know, Rob, you've been a sales leader for many, many years, yeah. um, as well as, you know, now being a retired sales leader and and doing some different work that we've all, that we've talked about. Yeah. What do you kind of think about, uh, about this, you know, starting from a sales leadership standpoint? Yeah. I, and, and I hope that they're not, and I didn't get that from this article or the video I watched that they're pitching yeah. us for sales or correct. They're know, not go to market executives. Right. Like, you know, I I'm hoping that, you know, we're not going to get that lazy. Right. Uh, Cause that just will implode the whole culture issue that I talk about all the time and the need for that. So, um, but the, the issue really for me is when, you know, there is, the human factor is so important to me, as you know, it's what I talk about. It's what I stand for, the human connection. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this goes against all of that, right? So to be provocative, I mean, this is just something that I am just absolutely not excited about. Um, And I can't see in my world ever using something like this. Uh, And we can go down to the least common denominator of, uh, you know, you said, uh, you know, a developer or, you know, project manager, or Mm -hmm. you know, still has to fit into the culture, still has to be the right fit, still has to be able to make a human connection. And you're not going to make that human connection with AI. So I'm not sure what job this would be good for. Um, And I'm I'm not really, you know, I I don't really have an answer for that, but I am hoping and praying it's not for go-to-market executive, which I don't think it is. No. It's the good news. No, it's not. It's, she it's, made that very clear. Yeah. We, and it's, yeah it's, she made that very clear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I don't, I don't want But that doesn't mean somebody's not going to make that promise that they can do that for a go-to-market executive. Exactly. And it, look, I don't want to shit all over this, right? I mean, this is not what this is about because this is, mm-hmm. you know, technology and, you know, how many times have I said, uh, you, you know, to learn to we live need that. to learn how to coexist with AI, with technology. And- that's going to be the kicker. That's going to get us the value that we need. How do we coexist with this, right? So that that's what I put back to you guys. Uh, you know, how could you coexist with this and and save some time or use it for, uh, you, you know, one of the things I saw that I, I kind of caught on to was um, interviewees could use it to practice. So that's a cool way to use AI. So I saw that. It kind of jumped out at me. It's like, well, role playing with AI. I don't know. Maybe. What do you guys think about that? Well, I I have a totally different take on AI's effectiveness, and it is that the model being implemented is for labor or cost or some type of savings or reduction. And I don't think AI can be successful that way. It can be successful if it's used as a tool for the employee. Uh, Employees have to navigate hundreds of HR issues And most of the time they're left with call any number of people to get any single line of advice. And uh, that list of people they call can change over time. It can differ over time. If you get a new vendor for health issues or for benefits issues, that changes. And I actually see the power of HR being something where 
you can actually have them be sort of a, a career partner or a career coach and a life coach for employees to get them through their journey because they're going to be handed off so many times mm. that it'll be frustrating. And the reality is if it could be developed as a center point around an employee's experience, then I think that's true value for an organization. I think every bit of cost savings that you're looking for um, in right now, it all seems to be staffing front loaded on AI. Uh, but I don't think that's where the cost savings are. I think the cost savings are in how can you deploy it to employees to make their lives more effective because they can mm -hmm. get answers quickly or they know what questions to even ask quickly. Um, I can tell you from having run an HR operation and watch people struggle with just the benefits questions alone. Uh, people make benefits choices without asking about the formularies. Yeah. And uh, AI could actually help someone navigate those questions, which formularies on which providers have the best options for me and my family. Now you have to call a benefit specialist to get to that. And if you're lucky, you have an experienced benefit specialist who knows where to go. But reality is you probably don't. So you're going to call a benefit specialist and then they're going to forward you to the external benefit services provider. And that person's may not even know what the formulary is. They just know to answer yes or no on what the actual drug request is. Um, tremendous potential in AI for that. But to date, I don't see or know of anyone looking at AI with the model upside down from the employee's perspective out, not from an HR person trying to fill a need in. Yeah, yeah that's actually really interesting. You'd want to say something, Rob? I was just going to, I was just going to ask you, Carol, like this is a question. The real question is like, you know, this is the shiny object. This is the new thing. Yep. You know, and, yep. and just because it can help, and it does these things. Doesn't mean it should. Doesn't mean it should, or does it mean that yeah. we use it? You know, I mean, yeah. how, you know, that's the question is just because we can, do we? Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, There's that's a that's a really good, it's a really good question. And, you know, listen, we've been in technology for a long time, all of us. And, you know, the, I'd say the common denominator is companies building software to help people do their jobs better. Right. Right. Right kind of a high level view. Yeah. You know, somebody comes up with something and they're like, yeah, this is going to help you do this better. This is going to help you save money on the back end. And, you know, then there has to be, of course, an ROI on it. So I guess the question is, um, as we often talk about that shiny object that you just mentioned, um, you know, I think right now it's just a big giant pile on. <laughs> <laughs> Right? right. With everybody going, oh, I can do the, you know, I, I mean, you know, we've talked about this. I get emails and LinkedIn's yeah. all week long. I'm yep. sure you do too, Daryl, about people trying to sell you something, you know, how AI is going to, you know, make your life so much better. Yep. And, you know, we've talked about this, so I don't, we don't really need to beat this dead horse, but I think that, that, so who's going to use something like that? A company who doesn't understand what search is. <laughs> That's who's going to do it, right? It's the same thing as putting your recruiting process underneath HR. We've talked about this, Daryl, mm -hmm. where, um, you know, 90, I, again, this is anecdotal, probably 98% of HR leaders, and you might have a better sense of this, um, Daryl, uh, have never done, run a search in their lives. <laughs> right. 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 Or or if they came out of search, they spent a year or two. And it was, you know, maybe with a staffing company. Um, right. Or not an actual agency, right? Right. Uh, so, or with a company that didn't train them. And to that type of leader, the yeah. promises are so tempting because yeah. they see the bottom line of I can save something or I can reduce mm. a head count. Mm -hmm. And I just, again, go back to if you look at how a lot of HRIS systems were developed. Mm hmm they had the same promise, the same big picture ideas, mm -hmm. yet people are still struggling years later. Some people have been working on implementation of an external HRIS software for a decade now. Um, that proves to me it doesn't work. 
And that doesn't mean it doesn't have value, but the way you do it needs to be very strategic, very planned, and then a very closely aligned tactical alignment when you put it in place. And most implementations of technology like this in HR don't tend to be set up that way. Why do you think that's the case? Well, there's two factors for me. First and foremost is I believe a lot of products are developed uh, hastily and probably are never going to be as good as they're promised. Uh, The second is from an internal company resource. I don't always see the investment that's necessary. And I kind of liken it to this. Um, Apple is spending uh, what we know are tens and maybe even to the hundreds of billions to try to make AI work and especially make Siri work better. If you are an organization, do you have that kind of resource to put into making your HR information flow better? And I just don't think most companies do. Um, I, I've, I've heard of lots of companies saying they're doing it, but I just haven't seen anyone really mm-hmm. actually doing it. Yeah, I mean this this comes this comes down to you know where where could it be used effectively? You know that's what we're really trying mm-hmm. to get to, right? And and you know is it is it going to be oversold? That's another thing that I think about all the time. Is is AI oversold? Right? No, it um, already is. It already <laughs> is, right? So there was a quote in this article from a bank CIO. We don't need you know AI whizzes. We need critical thinkers to challenge AI. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. I love that quote. And, you know, Fantastic. that quote along with the Bloomberg uh, resume experiment that that proved that AI really didn't work as well as it could have. Um, you know, there's a lot of gutches with AI. We talked about this offline, Carol, where, you know, you can put bad data into it and then it just it just mm-hmm. won't spiral from there. That's right. Um, and you you've got to really be careful. Um, you know, and I, we talked about my business of keynote speaking and, and, you know, what I could certainly go on to AI and, and, you know, Hey, develop a 45 minute keynote for me on building resilience and overcoming adversity, which is what I talk about all the time. And I could have it spit it out, but it wouldn't be mine. Um, yeah. and you know, that, that's really not, uh, you know, that's, that's the question of what I asked before, just because you can, doesn't mean you, you know, you have to. Um, but that's a perfect example of how people mm-hmm. can really get caught up on this AI saving time and money. And in the long run, if you hire the wrong person, it doesn't save time and money. You know, cost <laughs> your money in <laughs> yeah. time and right. time is money. Right. You know, it's interesting because um, as I'm listening to this, you know, one of the things in my talk on communication that I do, I, I, I have like, two or three sentences about AI in that entire 45 minute talk. Okay. And it's, it's utilize it. You know, how many, you know, how many of you have sent an email or received an email that the receiver, right. You or whoever you sent it to was confused. You know, you just didn't get the whole tone of it. All these other things, right. Mm -hmm. There's errors in it. So you're like, what the heck is this? So my comment is I'm going to make one point on AI and that is, you know, what? use it to check your work. (laughs) Before you send that email out. Oh, yeah. Maybe that'll, I mean, that, I think that can be a valuable use for it. I haven't, I haven't tried to do that yet. You know, every time, you know, I make a post on LinkedIn, um, it's like, oh, you want to use AI to rewrite it? And I've never done, I've never asked it to do that. I mean, maybe I will to see what it comes up with. Just, just for my own uh, um, interest in, is it producing how Carol thinks and how Carol speaks? Yeah. Right. in my tone of voice. And my, my concern also is with this first iteration, and I believe there will be yeah. multiple iterations, mm-hmm. uh, the data quality and data integrity isn't being questioned or challenged yeah, exactly. at all. And any HRIS suffers from garbage in, garbage out. And AI is not necessarily being sold as a garbage screener. Uh, which, quite frankly, I think that would be a better way of deploying the technology because there's a certain number of things that really do need to get cleaned up on the front end. Uh, but it's not being sold as a front end data scrub. Um, and, you know, if I were heading an HR department, 
I'd be more interested in knowing how it helps me with that because I would fully estimate 20% of the issues that are being cleaned up are issues because data was messed up in the first place. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think there's, you're totally correct about that. Right. Um, Rob, uh, I want you real quick so the audience can hear this. Tell yeah. the uh, high the high level story of the guy uh, that got disbarred in Florida. Oh yeah, yeah. So I read this article about a lawyer that got disbarred, and uh, so he had to write a court brief and uh, submit it. And he was running out of time, so he had AI do it, mm-hmm. and uh, he didn't check it. He sent it in to the judge, um, and AI just made up a case and actually cited a judge that that the judge that he sent it to knew. So he called up that judge and said, hey, is this a case? And I wanted to know more about this. And the judge is like, that's not a case. I don't know what that is. So they sort of went back to that lawyer and they said, hey, we need a little more detail. And sure enough, he used AI to get more detail and dug it even deeper. He did it three times. And then they finally got him and said, look, you're, you know, they just barred him. I mean, you know, it's the question I asked at the beginning. It's like, you know, just because we can, do we have to? Right. And, and where is the right thing to do? And Carol, you got a good point. It's like, Hey, you know, a lot of times I will hit the AI button on posts. I don't, I don't use them uh, a lot. Once in a while I'll, I'll go, Oh, that they put that first. And you know, Oh, exciting news where I might've said, Hey, I'd like to share with you exciting news. It may say, Hey, I have exciting news or whatever. It's little tiny nuances. Um, So I've used it a little bit there. And and to tell you the truth, it's pretty cool. Um, You know, but you know, again, where do you use it and how often do you use it? You know, you've got to be authentic. You've got to be yourself. And, and that's the most important part for me and my business, especially, I, I would never, I would never use AI to the fullest of that. Um, and I, and I think it goes back to building cultures and building teams you know, it's AI is not the right place for that. And again, I, I look at, I, I want to be clear, I, at least me, I'm not shitting on this at all. I think, I think that there's a place for AI I think that, you know, this product air could be really cool. Um, I think that there's benefits to it. Um, and I'm really excited to see where it goes. I'm really excited about mm-hmm. the company. Um, mm-hmm. And I just I just think that, you know, we're getting there. It's kind of percolating, but it's, you know, let's not oversell. I guess that, that'd be how I put a bow around this from my perspective, Carol. Let's not oversell this shiny object. You know, we as salespeople, we tend to do that sometimes. And this is a place where you don't want to oversell. Let's take a step back take a breath and see where we can actually use this. Like Daryl said, there mm-hmm. could be some uses for, you know, people yeah. that can, you know, I mentioned the practicing, the interviewing. I mean, let's see where we can use it to the benefit. Let's not just mm-hmm. throw it against the wall and say, Hey, AI is here. Let's save time. Let's save money. And that's not what happens. You know, it, it has me think about how many people are going to get screened out because of incorrect information. Right. right. I cannot remember the name of this company um, that was that law enforcement's been using it. Um, it's very, very stealth. Um, when I read about it, there was a way to get your all your photos removed from their database. Wow! Um, hmm. And what they're they're selling facial recognition to help all different sorts of things, but primarily it's being sold to law enforcement. Sure. And what they discovered early on is that it was misreading people of color, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure Daryl's not surprised to hear that. Um, And, and, and people that were completely innocent were getting picked up by the police. Um, And I I wish I could remember the name of the company, but I mean, like you can't even find it. And it was a story I heard. It was um, either on the daily from New York times or maybe fresh air with Terry gross. One of, you know, one of the podcasts I listened to, they interviewed the woman who, who basically uncovered this whole thing. Right. <laughs> right? And, right. And, and, and I think that, you know, in a bit of a different way, it's the same thing, mm. right? If it has a, some sort of a bias mm. to anything for whatever reason. Right. Um, and of course, AI learns, yeah. So if someone AI is talking to or, you know, they've somebody has said something negative about a certain type of person, you know, ethnicity, religion, whatever that might be, AI, I have to think it's going to be biased. Right. And in addition to that, I think there's also you know, kind of the practicality of applying it to just staffing alone. And yes. I've managed the staffing process enough to know that 
getting two managers to agree, agree on the same job opening or the same type of job is practically impossible. So AI is going to have to, like a person, sort out what does that manager actually mean when they say software engineer with what kind of background? And another software engineer, same job title from another manager, they don't care at all about some of the basics or the fundamentals of engineering. They really care about can the person see modeling differently? Well, that's very hard for a recruiter to understand unless they have one-on-one -on -one engagement right. on a regular basis with the managers. Right. And I don't think AI is going to be reaching, at least from what I've seen on the uh, the job uh, uh, application process, I don't see AI being interactive enough to really ev even have enough information to negotiate mm -hmm. those nuances. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm really concerned that most of what I've seen to date has been AI deployed in the job and the staffing process. And I think that's going to do a lot of damage and probably hurt the reputation of the tool when it's real value to me is put it in the hands of employees who really could use the service. Um, and, and right now I think a lot of, you know, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an outside company trying to develop this technology, right? but they have to really understand, are they developing an actual product? Or are they developing a service? Because mm. if you're just developing a service, it's very quick and easy to replicate it. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also very quick to be forgotten or engineered out. And I can't mm -hmm. tell you the number of HRIS systems uh, in my time I've Good seen uh, come and go in a heartbeat. That's a good point. It's a really good point. Um, it, just to step on, uh, step on top of, uh, you were, you've mentioned HRIS a couple of times, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I think part of the issue around whether it's that, or, you know, if you look at success factors, you know, that SAP, you know, bought subsequently bought or people soft, right. That subsequently Oracle purchased, um, you know, I spoke to people who were using those systems and, and if I can remember the wording they used, they're so, well, the only word I can think of right now is robust mm -hmm. that you don't have great compliance, right? Because they're too powerful. They do too much. Yeah. They're not necessarily user friendly. And I, you know, I talked to people that use those products and there was plenty of other ones like that. And I, I have to think that that's the same thing going on over here. They companies just producing stuff that's just there's just it's just too comprehensive. And for quite the, frankly, the average user. Quite yeah. frankly, a lot of companies struggle with hiring people who support those roles because they may know PeopleSoft, but they may not know Workday. And although they're very similar products in a lot of ways, uh, the way they're rolled out to customers. Is very different. Uh, I, I've actually seen and watched companies try to roll out both, and the cost alone makes everybody's head swell um, because, <laughs> because they 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 thought it was a cost savings. Yeah, and I think when you actually do the math on it, at best it's a push. Yeah. At absolute best, it's a push yeah. because then uh, if you want to if you want a new feature. Well, there's a new charge for that. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to customize things, there's a charge for that. Um, that's also another obstacle that AI is going to have to overcome because I think it's so new and so misunderstood or not understood that people are going to want to know in advance. Mm -hmm. Is it really going to save me? Because I know the last round of things I got into didn't actually save me. You know, um, one other thing uh, we I think circled we haven't circled this one a bit but I know we talked about it prior to this was part of what um, Brain Test Air is doing is you know they pitch you know the manager can type in what they want and then we'll we'll produce the job description <laughs> and I have massive problems with that as somebody 
who did retain search for so many years that when I sat down to actually create that position description, uh, my stakeholders in that meeting, uh, and I would send this ahead of time, usually about three days so they could review it to have an idea what we were going to talk about, contained 45 to 50 questions <laughs> to write one position description, right? Um, and it's because the AI doesn't know what I know or what some other great recruiter that does retained work knows that's building that position description. And the AI also doesn't know that once I get the uh, first draft written, it's going back to my stakeholders because I not I may not get everything right from that meeting. So, you know, I, I, they know their technology or whatever it is that, you know, better than I do. So, um, you know, by the, by the time we get to that third, it's usually, it's the final. And I'm thinking, where's AI going to be able to do this? I mean, I see, you see, you know, look on any job site, LinkedIn or zip recruiter that you hear on all the finance. Oh, you know, we're going to solve all your, we're a panacea, man. We're going to solve all your problems. And I think bullshit. I just totally call bullshit on that because, um, if you look at these job descriptions are horrible. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not to <laughs> horrible. Account. That doesn't even account for the fact that once you do think you have a good job description, now you have to bridge the language to what job seekers are looking for. Because if you just put mm -hmm. a job description up there, it may be so specific to your company that no one's interested. Um, the reality is you need what I call, you know, market genericized language so that you can get people attracted. And I don't know that, I don't know that AI is going to be able to learn on the fly enough mm. and fast enough to do that, to be helpful in the recruiting and staffing portion. And, uh, you know, I've focused on that because I've seen a lot of attempts to address that and uh, and rather than go out and get a better set of recruiters, I don't think AI is the way to go because I just don't know how the information is going to be captured. Yeah. Um, I don't know that there's going to be a legacy so no, so people know what the adjustment is. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting as I'm, as I'm listening to you, Daryl, I'm thinking, right, so companies are making stuff like this because Companies don't know, first of all, they don't know how to hire a recruiter for the most part, right? I mean, a qualified recruiter. Let me just put that in there, right? I mean, they can hire a recruiter. You know, I saw, I saw something today on somebody's background. You know, they had, they had one year, they'd never done recruiting before, and all of a sudden they were a senior recruiter. I'm like, okay, how's that, how's that happen? <laughs> right? And, and I think, you know, like I've said this before, I blame the internet <laughs> for this. The internet came out, you know, pretty much to the public in 1994, right? Yep. Yeah, 30, 30 years ago. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. And um, all of a sudden, somebody said, oh, guess what we can do? We can put an ad on Hot Jobs or um, Yahoo. Well, Yahoo was Hot Jobs, right? Monster. And of course, now there's a zillion more of those. Um, when it's still just a job ad, right? You know, post and pray. Yeah. Um, guess who's going to be looking at those job ads? People who need a job. Right. So I think there's so much direct out there in the industry, which is why I left the industry and teach companies how to do this now Yeah. so they can actually get it done properly. Yeah. Um, it's just, it, 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 this is the reason it has, it has devalued so much of the industry that any idiot can do it. And I hate to say that, but that's yeah. kind of how it comes out. Yeah. You know, recruit, recruiting isn't sitting behind a desk and waiting for the resumes to come in. Right. And, that's and not to what a that, headhunter does. Yeah. To that point, Carol, I would say again, if the, if the funnel or the model is turned upside down, uh, if by chance you have a spectacular recruiter, then your AI contribution should be, force multiplying that person's capability, not replacing it, not making it cheaper, but force multiplying it because it is a, it is a skill that very few people have uh, and have developed well. And I don't think the answer is, is always just put a body in there and give them this button to press. Uh, sometimes it's literally uh, the person I have 
needs to be able to access things better, um, access things more completely. And if the AI recruitment model is developed that way, then I think there's a better chance at success. Um, but if it's developed as a recruitment, uh, and regardless of what people say, when you, when you, it, it's being developed as a recruiting replacement, let's face it. That's really what it is. I don't want to hire more recruiters or I want more than I currently have. And I don't want to pay salary and benefits. Um, so I'll find another alternative. Um, the reality is that's not how you bring the best people into an organization. So. Uh, yeah. the, you do that by the best people you have clearing things out of their way. Well, getting them. And it's, and I want to hear something from you, Rob, but, and it's also, um, about great recruiting is great enterprise level sales. Right. Exactly. Well said. Well said. I mean, I think, um, the recruiting of sales or go to market executives, um, is a unique animal. Because I think it is uh, it is something that um, transcends sort of what this is talking about. Because those are the people um, um, that are the you know the front of the store. You know the people that are really the culture and what people see from the outside. Um, and you know the recruiting has to be so on. It has to be so on because. Uh, and it has to be aligned with the hiring manager, right? Those are the keys, right? So this is about collaboration with a recruiter. It's collaboration with HR. It's an HR partner. We use that word a lot now. Um, you know, before I retired, uh, well, you know, months ago, uh, you know, the last few years we were, you know, HR partner was really cool. And, you know, having that person by my side and making sure that, you know, I was checking, balancing the, what I was doing. Um, and that was, for me, it was a game changer. And I think that like anything else, the recruiter has to be that partner and has to be aligned with what, you know, what the culture of the company is and what, what mm -hmm. the personality the, and the mission, the vision, all that stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's important. That's for me, that's important. Yeah. Well, and that's why I advocate for a chief talent officer. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. The, and that's you say the person, a lot. But that chief talent officer has to have years in years of experience yeah. and really know what they're doing to yeah. do this, yeah. to well, be, this you is, know, to really be seen by the executive team as another, another, you know, seat at that executive table. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. This has been a, uh, a wonderful discussion. I think that mm -hmm. it, hopefully it's, it's open some eyes and get, you know, people, we want people talking about this. We want, we want yes. feedback, right? We're not, you know, this is not end all be all right. And again, this is just uh, our opinions and, you know, and, and, We'd love to get that feedback. So all the listeners that are listening to this, if they've made it to the end, uh, please, um, you know, give us your feedback, your thoughts, uh, your contributions are, are so wanted here and we're grateful for those. So, you know, in that, uh, with that regard, just final thoughts from, from you guys, uh, Daryl, any final thoughts on this subject as we, as we part here? Yeah, I would suggest that before you make a decision that you want to go down the AI path, uh, have a very clear understanding of what you want to get out of it because there are mm -hmm. going to be a myriad of tools and options, but I'm not sure any of them are going to solve what your ultimate itch yeah. is. Yeah, cool. I love that. Yeah. Carol? I do too. I, I got no point to put on top of that. Um, <laughs> Good. But if we get, if we get enough, if we get enough um, interaction and people want to talk about this, We'll uh, come back and do a part B for September or October. Yeah. Maybe we'll have a different guest on too. Who knows? Maybe we may we'll yep. meet somebody and bring them on, you know? So that'd be yep. wonderful. All right, guys. Thanks so much for this great conversation. As always, uh, signing off uh, for now. Uh, uh, after hours, uh, authentically successful. Thanks for listening to Authentically Successful After Hours. I'm your host, Carol Schultz. And I'm your co-host, Rob Swimer. Hey, don't forget to click follow to hear more. And please leave us an honest review and rating so we can continue to improve and bring you more great stories. Thanks again for listening and see you next time.